Laura is professor in uh, medical imaging. Yes. And uh, big hero in this field. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks, Ryan. I'm not sure about that, but, uh, but yes, yes, I, I've been in Alta University for quite some time. I also worked, and I still have a, a small part of my time in the private sector in a, in a company that, uh, that does its business in the, in the medical uh, imaging industry. Uh, it's called Electa OY, operating here in Helsinki. Uh, and the, the product is uh, uh, magnetoencephalography. Which is actually, I mean, the, that, that part of the company is a spin-off from this, this university already in the early 90s. Um, I will actually not talk so much about uh, the methods to, uh, to measure the brain. I will do mention them and, and uh, explain some use cases. But most of the talk will be about um, how do our brains accomplish the, the, uh, the rather complex um, task of uh, supporting interaction with other people and how do we understand what other people are thinking or doing, what are their intentions and, and, and so forth. Um, so before I go on, I'd like to ask, so whose background is in mathematics? Okay, anyone in neurosciences or from neurosciences? Not really, psychology or something related, no? And I think in operations research, so then it's about everyone, so <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, I will first talk about the sort of general ideas of, of how do we do, um, or how could the brain uh, maintain models of uh, its surroundings. Um, this is on a very sort of conceptual level, so, so then how it applies to a particular situation. So that this is uh, largely something that we don't actually know yet. But anyway, this provides the sort of conceptual framework. Um, then I have um, some theoretical arguments and also some experimental data on, on how we understand the intentions of others and how can we imitate other people. These two things are, are quite connected. And then I'll go on uh, talking about the interaction, so social interaction with other people. How do we study that? Uh, um, what does it involve? And then um, end with uh, what we have coined as two-person neuroscience. Um, uh, which involves experiments, uh, which have in part been, or be, they are being done here in this university, so you will see the facilities then when you have this tour in the neuroimaging facility. Yes? Will you make slides available to us? Um, we haven't really discussed that. I promised to send them over to, to Raimo, so that, uh, that obviously means that you will probably get them, so <laughs> yes. Okay, so, so what is the, the, the most important task of the brain? So maybe you don't usually think about it, but, uh, but for sure I think if you really want to, to, to make it simple, so it's probably to, to keep the organism alive. And now, how does it do that in, in an optimal manner? So it has to be able to make predictions about what is happening in the environment, what is happening to the organism itself, because otherwise you would only be in a reactive mode. And, and for many things that's, that's um, it doesn't allow us to, uh, to act in an optimal manner. Everything will be delayed. We are not able to make uh, the optimal decisions if we only do them based on the, uh, the immediate information that is coming to us. And yeah, so the brain has to maintain a model of the environment. And uh, so that means, of course, learning to build the model, uh, keep it there, uh, maybe update it where there is more information. And, and this more information is coming through our senses, obviously. So now this could be applied on many different levels. Uh, but to illustrate it, I have a simple uh, example uh, in the domain of, of vision. Uh, so this picture, uh, although it's in 2D, uh, you will probably say that, okay, there is a, an ordinary three-dimensional house, what you are seeing there. But now, when you walk a little further and then have an other angle to this object, it turns out like this. So then obviously the model you had, the internal model of what this object is, was not correct. Uh, even though this is compatible with this observation, when you are looking at this kind of a thing from the right angle, but this is so unlikely that I don't think anyone would think 
that what is underlying this 2D image is something like this, although it's compatible with the information you get. Uh, and this is because the prior probability of this kind of object is extremely low compared to ordinary three-dimensional houses, as we are used to, to seeing them. Uh, so this kind of thinking can be conceptualized in, in the... Um, there are many ways, but, but one, maybe the most prominent line of thinking uh, regards the brain as a, as a Bayesian inference machine, which uh, operates at many levels. I heard that in the morning there has been a lot of discussion on, on Bayesian modeling, Bayesian approaches, and the Bayes formula, and, and how it's maybe misinterpreted and, and all that. So this is one more thing to the, <laughs> to the confusion. Um, so the learning that we do, so that would mean that, that we are able uh, to obtain better, more accurate prior information um, about how the world is. Then, uh, now, conceptually, the sensory information that you get in through your eyes, for example, so it's not the same thing as the percept that you are having. So sensory input is something uh, uh, physical and the percept is a subjective state. So that's what you are seeing. And of course, you are aware there are a lot of illusions where, which trick your brain or your mind uh, to perceive something else than uh, what is actually there. And this is just illustrating the difference. So the sensory input is not the same thing as what you perceive, but there is a lot of, say, brain machinery in between. <laughs> and now one way to, uh, to conceptualize this is that the probability of a certain, say, state in the world, see uh, there being a certain uh, true object, uh, given the sensory input, is equal now to the probability of that sensory input given a certain uh, a state in the world. So this is like the generative part. So if we assume that, that there is a certain three-dimensional object and we are looking at it from a certain way, so what's the probability of seeing a certain uh, 2D representation of that object? Then we have the probability of the world, so a cer or a certain configuration of the world, and then normalization by the probability of the sensory input. So with the example that I showed you, so we could have sensory input one, which would be this view. Uh, then the prediction of how the world is would be that there's a normal uh, three-dimensional house because the prior probability of that kind of an object is pretty high. Now, with the sensory input two, then uh, you get a different uh, prediction of the most likely state of the of the world, uh, and and this is only happening because the prior probability of this uh, world two is very low. I mean something like this. Of course, this is also a two D representation, but I think with the two together, you can figure out how the the true object is like. Okay, so this is, this is the conceptual framework where uh, some of the computational modeling of, of the brain uh, takes place. Now this can be applied in a, in a very simple case as well. Uh, this is about cued uh, hand movements. So if you're presented with a target that you have to um, aim with your finger, just to point with a finger, uh, so then uh, your brain does a model that how do you need to exert your muscles in order to bring your hand there. So this is like the generative, the forward model. And, and so this is what the brain and the nervous system and the muscles then do. Uh, but then there might be some error that your, your uh, index finger is not exactly there where the target is. And you have to correct that. And, uh, and so there is a kind of a prediction error which is fed back to the system. And then the brain then does corrective actions to, to bring your finger there where it's supposed to be. And of course the whole idea of how you command the muscles to, uh, to achieve certain uh, accents is uh, to a large extent learned by this kind of a sort of feedback loop. So the brain gets information about not only through vision but only also through so-called proprioception, so the, our sense of how our limbs are. Because of course, even if you close your eyes, you know how your hands are, roughly. Um, so that there is this kind of a loop and, and there are uh, several levels of hierarchy. So at the lowest level you have what happens with the sensory information. On top of that you have uh, 
uh, more abstract level and then maybe at the top you have uh, some abstract goals that you want to reach and, and, and so forth. All right, so with that framework, so um, let's move on to um, how do we understand, how do we imitate others? Well, obviously I'm not going to explain how that happens, but, <laughs> but give you some, some um, uh, say, uh, ideas uh, to think about. Um, so this is a, a cartoon that, that's been used uh, with kids uh, to probe their understanding of the other minds. And uh, so the, the idea is that there are these two characters, Sally and Anne, and uh, Sally puts a, pole, a ball in the, in the basket, Anna is watching, then Sally goes away, then Anna comes and moves the ball from the basket to the box, uh, and they are both covered. Then Sally comes back, and now where would she look uh, for the ball? So very young kids say that, well, of course she will look to the box, because that's where the ball is. Then all the kids realize that, well, Sally doesn't know that the ball is in the box, so she will look into the basket because that's the last piece of information that she got. Uh, and so it's only at a certain age that you start to understand uh, that uh, how the other person's mind works, that you can somehow simulate the role of the other person. <coughs> and in, in certain disorders, like in the autism spectrum disorders, uh, then people are actually not able to figure out this, that they, they will go for, for the box because well, they understand that that's where the box is now, but they don't understand that Sally doesn't know that the ball is in the, uh, not in the basket. <coughs> right, so this thinking of the state of the mind of the other person and the intentions of the other person is called theory of mind. Uh, so it's our cognitive capability uh, um, and uh, it could happen on, at the first order, so uh, I'm thinking of your uh, intentions, and the second order, so I'm thinking what you're thinking of my intentions. And then of course you could just apply that ad infinitum, but, uh, but going beyond the third order is already getting pretty difficult and uh, people don't <laughs> normally do that or, or are any, unable to do that. Um, so how does that, uh, how does the, the brain perform something like that? So how do we represent the intentions of other people? So we could have, just theoretically, we could have a dedicated system uh, to the intentions of other people. So which is only trying to process what other people are, are thinking, what are they likely to do, and that would be separate from our own system, because of course we also have intentions. We are planning our actions and, and, and so forth. And, and we have predictions of how our actions will uh, affect the world around us. Uh, so one option would be to have separate systems. Another option is to use the same system, because uh, to a large extent this kind of prediction and planning is shared, because of course, well, as humans, and also with respect to some of the animals, we are quite similar. So, so our, the way our mind works and, and how do we, how we make predictions of what's, what happens as a result of our actions, that also applies to other people. So that, therefore it makes sense to, uh, for the brain to use the same circuitry for uh, doing these uh, predictions of, of other people. Now the problem there is that how do we deal uh, with the agency? So how does the brain keep track of like whose intentions these are, whether they are your own or someone else's? So there has to be an explicit system that is somehow uh, separating these two. In some cases this may actually go wrong. So there's quite a bit of evidence that it's the second option that's taking place. Uh, but then we have to have something which, which uh, uh, tells apart our intentions from those of the others. And uh, this is a study uh, from mid-90s, uh, rather famous one, where people discovered the so-called mirror neuron systems in monkeys. So they were recording uh, an area called F5 in monkey, which is uh, the homologue of uh, Broca's region in humans, which is responsible for uh, sequencing actions and, and uh, also for speech production. And uh, the researchers were recording 
uh, neurons. You can see that the traces, the firing traces here. And uh, so these neurons were firing when the monkey was grasping raisins or something like that from a table in front of the monkey. And then, by surprise, these neurons were also firing when the experimenter was doing the same thing. But the monkey didn't move uh, uh, his arms at all. Um, and so this was then a, a big surprise. So the, the researchers were not looking for anything like this. So they were coined mirror neurons because they apparently f uh, seem to mirror the, the actions of others. But of, of course there are now multiple explanations. So it could be that they are mirroring either just the action or, or the movement. So it could be that whenever any agent, either the monkey or the human, just does a similar movement, so then then uh, these, these neurons will fire. So, so that's, uh, that's one interpretation. Then a sort of a higher level interpretation is that these neurons are encoding the goal of the, of the action. And now then for the uh, goal of the uh, monkey and for the experimenter to go and pick up a raisin uh, from the table, so that's the same. And uh, now there was a clever experiment by the same uh, group. So they made these kind of pliers which you operate in different ways to achieve the same goal. So you pick up something, uh, but in order to do that you need to uh, perform different movements. Uh, and these neurons, they respond in a very similar manner, no matter which tool you are using. So the details of the movement are definitely not the reason for those, those neurons to fire. But it really seems that it's the, it's the immediate goal of the, of the movement that is, that is important for, uh, for those neurons. Then uh, it also seems to make a difference where uh, the, the target or where this, uh, um, this movement happens, where the goal is in a way. So uh, say classical neural neurons, they respond no matter how, what's the distance uh, from the monkey or probably also from the human. But then there are some neurons which only respond when uh, the, the goal uh, involves a target that is in the extrapersonal space. So it means that it's outside of the immediate reach of the, of the uh, animal or the human. So that you would need your body in order to, to for example, touch or reach uh, that object. Uh, and then there are some other neurons which fire only when uh, the target is within your peripersonal space, meaning that just by a reaching movement you can, you can grasp the object. So there's also this, kind, this kind of a uh, distinction. So then what's being done here uh, on humans uh, using this MEG tool, I will explain a little bit about that later, but uh, I think for this uh, you can understand without knowing anything about the uh, imaging method. So the task of the subject was to imitate uh, these lip forms. So one of these seven figures was presented at one time to the subject. They were shown in a random order. And then the task of the subject was to, to produce the same kind of lip form. And we did that while recording uh, brain activity. And you can see here uh, the temporal sequence of brain activations in that task. So it starts, zero time is the presentation of that face that you have to imitate. So about 100 milliseconds later, you get a response in the visual cortex. So that's about processing the visual information that comes in. Then uh, some 40, 50 milliseconds later, there is activity in the um, so-called superior temporal sulcus, in the temporal lobe, and then in the parietal lobe, and then in this blockus region which I mentioned, which is the homologue of the monkey F5, uh, and then finally in the motor cortex, which then commands the muscles. And all, the, whole, the whole thing takes uh, about 150 milliseconds. There is of course stuff happening uh, in subcortical structures before that 100 milliseconds to just pass the visual information from, from the retina to the, to the V1 to the primary visual cortex. So but in 200 and 60 milliseconds roughly, so then uh, motor cortex activates and then uh, the muscles are, are activated soon after. So okay, so there is nothing really exciting here. I mean, this is kind of expected result. But what was 
uh, very surprising was that if you are just observing these lip forms, but you are asked not to imitate them yourself, we have the same activation sequence, although slightly delayed uh, for the last two nodes in this network, if you will. Um, so this is a, a manifestation of this mirroring uh, type of activity. So those things which we could perform ourselves, uh, but we are not actually performing, but we are just following. And I think it's safe to say that, that we are sort of understanding or trying to understand what, what it's about. So we activate the same circuits as we use for performing those uh, movements ourselves. And then as a control condition, uh, the subjects were just shown uh, pictures of landscapes. So then there is nothing you could possibly imitate. And then you only have the first two sources active, and then uh, the rest are silent. Uh, so then, what does it mean? Um, uh, this is now the same picture on a sort of cartoon, like of illustration. Uh, so we have the processing of the visual information uh, in these first two nodes, then the processing of the kinesthetics, trying to infer the intention. Uh, then Broca's region would be about the goals, uh, sequencing of the actions, and then finally the motor cortex for the motor uh, output. Then if you try to cast that into the Sabayesian uh, framework, so the visual input would be some sort of a prediction error, so that's a signal of what you need to do, what is different now from uh, uh, in the world with, with respect to your, uh, your intentions. So a reflection of the task. And then uh, these blue arrows show uh, the results of generative modeling. So uh, this modeling of how the world would change if we did uh, a, a certain act. <coughs> right, so then let's move on to this uh, interaction uh, studies. Uh, social interaction has been a, a topic in, in neuroscience in particular that has been avoided for a long, long time. Uh, I think this quote is quite descriptive, so that uh, social interaction is an unusually rich and interesting topic, exactly what social psychologists would wish to study and many neurobiologists think is too fuzzy to study. Uh, it's definitely a little bit fuzzy, uh, particularly if we approach it in the way that we have uh, traditionally approached uh, brain function. I'll try to explain why. Um, so now one can uh, look into the brain function uh, functions that support social interaction in different ways. So if we like follow the, uh, this is a, almost like in a chronological order how brain research has evolved. So in the beginning uh, people used uh, because of technical limitations but also because of uh, uh, arguments about how to do brain science, they used well-controlled artificial stimuli. So if you wanted to study vision uh, you showed uh, your subjects some gratings, line segments, something very deprived of, of information, extremely simple elements. <coughs> or if you studied audition, then maybe tone pips or, or single notes or something like that. This has yielded a lot of valuable information from the brain, so I'm not at all trying to, to bash this approach. It's just that it's maybe not the best one to, uh, to approach social interaction. Then you can make things a bit more complex, so you can show naturalistic uh, stimuli. So if you want to study social interaction, you could, for example, show uh, still pictures of uh, faces of other humans. And then the task could be to identify the person or uh, m uh, try to pick up the emotion the person in the picture is having and, and, and so forth. Uh, but this is, of course, it's naturalistic in a sense, but it's not very ecological. It, this is not what we encounter every day. Then you can go dynamic, you can use movies as a, as a stimulus. This is, of course, uh, quite a bit more complex already, uh, but still we are lacking the, the, the true interaction. So then for the interaction we can think about a slowly paced interaction. So if we write letters to each other or text messages, emails, uh, so the time span is, is 
uh, it can be long, and, and the, the lags between the turns, is, uh, they are quite long as well. And then, finally, uh, dynamic embodied interaction, like we do in a face-to-face -face conversation. So the pace is quite fast, uh, and we have to be proactive, at least here, because we, in order for us to reply properly, we have to analyze what the other person is doing, while he or she is speaking, we have to estimate when it's our turn uh, to start speaking and all that, which we don't have to do in any of these other uh, modes. So the first three, so they can be repeated. So you can repeat exactly the same stimulus sequence over and over again to the same person or to different persons. And, and this helps enormously in the data analysis because we can average, for example, the brain responses to the presentation of the stimuli and, and look at the, the commonalities and, and so forth. But uh, the, the subject is passive, so, so he or she is only receiving the information. Processing it maybe yes, but not having to act upon it. Whereas the number four and five, so there uh, we have an active role. So uh, both of the participants, so there could be of course more than two, but at least two. So they are engaged in the interaction and what they do will depend on what the other person does. And, uh, and these are unique, so you cannot repeat. I mean, if you have a conversation and uh, you, would, you are recording brain activity and then you wanted to improve your, improve your signal to noise ratio by repeating the same conversation and then averaging the signals, I mean, this doesn't make any sense because uh, that conversation, of course, you could in theory repeat it but the mental state of these uh, people who are conversating, that would be totally different because it's not a new, con it's not a natural conversation anymore when you do it the second time with exactly the same kind of wording. It's a theater play or something like that, more than a conversation. Um, so then, of course now, I'll, I'll focus on this, uh, the last item here. And uh, there, um, what we need to analyze is no longer the brain activity of one person, but we would rather go uh, for the joint activity of the interacting partner. So we can talk about the dyad. So the analysis unit is no longer one brain, but two brains, uh, or two persons instead of one person. And uh, so earlier I, I spoke about this, these loops that we are exerting motor commands uh, which affect our environment. We get sensory uh, information back uh, as a result or changing the sensory uh, information as a result of our actions. Uh, we make also sensory predictions and there's this kind of a loop. Now when we are interacting with another person, these loops get intertwined because it's not only our actions that change uh, what's happening outside of us, but it's also the actions of the other person. And no matter who changes things, both will get the sensory input of that change. So uh, if you would ignore the other part here and then try to analyze that using the loop and the activity from, an, from one brain only, so it's obviously um, something is lacking, so then you, you can't make a full model uh, just doing that. Um, so I have a couple of examples how to study interaction. I start from something extremely simple, but, but I think uh, uh, this is still a powerful experiment. And this doesn't involve any neuroimaging. It's just a behavioral thing. Uh, and in this study, uh, there were two so participants or players, and the only thing they could do is to move a lever in one dimension. So this, this is extremely reduced interaction. So the only thing they could do is just to move a slider uh, uh, on a, this kind of a bar or, or so. And, uh, but there were two conditions. So they either the experimenters assigned one of the, the persons as a leader and then the other one was a follower. Or then they asked the, the persons uh, to jointly uh, improvise some movements. They didn't specify which kind of movements they, they need to do, but just say that do some interesting movements together. And uh, then uh, the positions of these levers, so they were measured with high precision, uh, both in space and time. And then one can then plot uh, the positions of, of, the, of the two. And now this is the leader follower uh, condition. Uh, the blue and the red trace are just the, the two uh, participants, their movements. 
we can see that of course they, they seem to overlap uh, quite well. Uh, and also the same thing with the joint improvisation condition. Uh, so they, at this scale, they seem to be on top of each other quite nice. But the time scale is, is quite wide, so it's 10 seconds, this bar here. Now, if you zoom in, uh, so in the leader-follower condition, there is quite a bit of difference, actually, because the, the other person is, is uh, more in a, in a reactive mode. So the follower is in a reactive mode, and, uh, and, and therefore it cannot track so well the, the other person because you don't have the same kind of model of what's, what's happening. But then, if you're in the joint improvisation mode, so that there is no designated leader, then this difference between the movements is a lot smaller. And there's a larger percentage of this, what the authors called co-confident motion, uh, where, where this uh, jitter is, is really small. Um, and then, you can build a model uh, I mean, given the complexity of the brain, the model is, is, is pretty simple, but nevertheless it, it reproduces the same kind of uh, uh, behavior as, uh, as human persons in, in this kind of a task. And now, so what we can conclude from that. So when people are improvising, uh, the differences in the movements are, perhaps a little bit surprisingly, they are smaller than in the case when there is a, a designated leader and then the other person is following. So somehow there is an agreement how the improvisation is, is, is done, although it's seemingly random. So one can read or there is mutual understanding of, of what's going to happen next and then you can be at least a bit more in the proactive mode rather than being just in a, in a reactive mode. <coughs> So then, if we want to move on to neuroimaging. Um, so traditionally, of course, neuroimaging has been done in a way that, that you measure one person, give a certain kind of stimuli. The stimulation could, be, uh, could involve uh, social situations. Uh, of course, you could even have one person interacting with another person who is not being measured. So this is technically relatively easy. And it's a traditional approach. We have a number of tools available to analyze the data. There is scientific tradition to that and, and, and so forth. Uh, we can, uh, at least in theory, measure both of the interactions, uh, interactors at the same time. Uh, so this is uh, usually referred to as hyperscanning. So uh, doing neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging of, of, of the participants at the same time. And there is no tradition, because <laughs> this is technically pretty challenging. Uh, so therefore, there are, at the moment, there are no tools, uh, at least no established tools to, to analyze the signals and, and so forth. But is this necessary? So do we have to do that? Do we learn something more by, uh, by doing this hyperscanning measurement as opposed to just measuring uh, one person? So as I said earlier, so we can study social interaction by measuring one person and then also measuring the interaction. So the, say the physical movements, gaze position, uh, speech, and so forth. Uh, and then we can try to make sense out of the brain data, try to uh, pick up those features in the signals that reflect uh, brain processes that support social interaction. So this is, this is perfectly okay and, and it's a viable uh, approach. But the problem is that in order to do that, we need to interpret the interaction. So what does it mean to make a certain movement? So actually you have to involve a third person here who is uh, somehow putting labels on the type of interaction that, that we see in the experiment. There might be things that uh, we would just totally overlook uh, when we are consciously uh, trying to analyze or annotate the data, but they might still be very important. So there is a, a danger for a big bias if you, if you do it uh, this way. And now, by measuring the brain activity of both participants at the same time, uh, you can, at least in part, work around this problem. Because now you don't necessarily need to quantify or annotate the interaction itself. But you could just look for the, uh, either for the commonalities or for the predictive power in the uh, signal set uh, 
from one brain uh, to that of the other brain. So, so you can look at, let's say, correlations. There could be much more complex metrics uh, uh, to quantify the, the similarities. But, uh, but let's say that if there are correlations between the brain signals, so then they have to reflect uh, something similar uh, in, in the two brains, uh, which then is seemingly related to the, to the fact that they are in the same situation. This is technically, of course, a lot more challenging than, than the first option. But nevertheless, it has been done uh, with several imaging modalities. So fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a method uh, that uh, shows brain activity based on uh, hemodynamics, so the metabolic changes. So those areas that are activated, they consume more energy, more oxygen, and then the, uh, the uh, blood circulation system is actually oversupplying those regions. With, with oxygenated blood, and, and this is the, uh, the physiological process that leads to the contrast or to the signal that we measure with fMRI. The problem is that it's pretty slow, so the activation has to be there for at least a second or a few seconds. Um, then uh, EEG or electroencephalography, that's easy to use in two persons at the same time, uh, but it has problems, uh, namely the spatial resolution is not very good. And then we can use MEG also, and that's what we've been doing here. I will tell a little bit more about that just in a second. So with fMRI, uh, we have uh, uh, been developing this kind of an approach where you can have two persons in the same MRI, uh, MRI scanner at the same time. So they can be face to face, a bit like this, or then uh, sort of laying down uh, just uh, side by side and facing each other. Uh, so you can image them and their brains uh, at the same time. So then this is, uh, although there are technical challenges, but, uh, but then you immediately get the data in, in the same um, way from both uh, participants. With EEG, this is a study done in France. Um, so there's an uh, imitation uh, task. So one person, the hands are being imaged by a camera and then that is presented to the screen of the other person and vice versa and their task was to, to do similar uh, movements. And now uh, what is shown here is the analysis result uh, of the difference of the synchrony between the two conditions. So either synchronous imi imitation or no synchrony. They are just doing the same kinds of hand movements but they are totally unaware of what the other person is doing. So the alpha and new beta, they refer to different frequency bands in the, in the EEG signal. So alpha is about 10 hertz, beta about 20 hertz, and gamma above 30 hertz. So there's this kind of functional coupling with the brain activity while they are uh, at this uh, task and in the synchronized mode. Uh, people have also done experiments with more people, uh, four people playing a guard game uh, uh, while uh, their EEG is being measured. Also playing a, this kind of an old-fashioned computer game, this ping-pong game <laughs> together with EEG being measured. So now, as I said, the problem with EEG is that the spatial resolution is uh, very modest and it's difficult uh, to separate the brain regions that are contributing to the signals. So EEG uh, has significantly better spatial resolution, but the technology is a lot more expensive. So I just explained the difference here. So if we have a population of neurons active at some uh, part of the cortex, so there are electric currents in those neurons, which then generate a potential distribution on the scalp. So by attaching two or more electrodes, so you can measure that difference. So this is EEG. But there is also a magnetic field due to the same uh, or similar sources, and that you can also pick up from the outside of the head, and this is, this is MEG. Now the problem with EEG is that we have the skull bone in between, which has a pretty poor conductivity compared to the soft tissues, and that blurs the, the uh, spatial topography of the uh, 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 voltage difference or the potential uh, distribution. And that's the reason why EEG cannot really resolve the locations of the, of the sources too well.
<coughs> okay, so this is uh, another view. So if you zoom into the cortex, uh, these are the different layers of the gray matter uh, and currents in the so-called apical dendrites of pyramidal cells are the ones that generate the signal. There are actually many kinds of signals that what you can get with MEG and EEG. This is a hypothetical stimulus with this kind of a time course. There's very brief stimulus in the beginning, <coughs> uh, a fraction of a second, then a, something like a two second stimulus and then a 15 second stimulus. Uh, to this very brief stimuli, you already get uh, what is called an evoked response. So a time-locked transient response to any change. And this happens particularly to changes in the sensory input. So many people are viewing these evoked responses as kind of prediction errors or model update signals or something like that if you want to look at the brain in, in this, uh, uh, say, Bayesian model uh, context. But there are also modulations of rhythmic activity. So the brain is continuously uh, oscillating, or certain parts of the brain are oscillating at certain frequencies. Uh, and now the amplitude of, of these oscillations is being modulated by ex both by external stimulation and by a task that, that is given to you. Uh, but the phase of that oscillation is typically not time-locked to the external events. So what we normally look at is the envelope uh, so the instantaneous amplitude, and there you can identify certain features. So during the time of the stimulus processing, there's usually a suppression at low frequencies and then a rebound. So for example, if you are given a visual stimulus, a complex scene that you need to analyze, the 10 hertz activity goes down for that time, and then, uh, for example, then if, if you uh, shift to a task that involves motor activity, then the, the uh, alpha uh, the 10 hertz activity of the visual system goes up. So it's an, kind of an antagonistic behavior. So the more suppressed the rhythm, the more activity you have in those regions. Then we have these gamma oscillations uh, at higher frequencies, and their behavior is just the opposite. So usually during the task uh, or, or during the stimulus processing, their amplitude is higher than uh, what it is at rest. And just for comparison, this is the hemodynamic response of what you would measure with fMRI. So given this kind of a stimulus waveform, for the very short stimulus, uh, you don't really get much of a signal, but then for the long stimulus, you get a beautiful signal. So that's why the experimental designs and the questions that you're ans answering with MEG versus uh, with fMRI are usually quite different, because the timing uh, uh, of the stimulation needs to be different to optimally utilize its method. Right, so then, how do we do this kind of a dual MEG or hyperscanning MEG recording? So this technology, as I mentioned, is, is uh, rather expensive. You need to have uh, extremely sensitive detectors. They need to be housed in a magnetically shielded drone, which you will see in a, in a moment. Uh, so these installations are multiple millions of euros or dollars, so we don't have the money to have two systems in the same room. But we are lucky in the sense that there is another similar system in the hospital just about five kilometers from here. So we are now here in Otaniemi. And, and then in Meilahti, on the Helsinki side, just across the bay, so there is a rather similar system. So what we did is that we connected these two systems uh, through the internet, providing the subjects with an audiovisual link so that they could see each other. So here's the, uh, the subject looking at the subject in the other system on the screen uh, and then uh, he's also able to hear the other other person and vice versa. We also have a camera that is tracking the eye movements. We have accelerometers in the fingers so we can also track the, uh, the, the finger movements. And uh, so what's important is that the delay in this link is just a little bit above 100 milliseconds and uh, according to the participants that we've been measuring so far uh, this delay is not uh, too long to hamper the interaction. So they feel that they are just in a, in a as natural interaction as you can have with this kind of a sort of mediated presence. Uh, okay, so there are some details about the, the, the technical part, but uh, anyway, the bottom line is that this is good enough for 
for natural interaction as far as timing is concerned. Uh, this is uh, showing the behavioral data. So the task here was to do uh, synchronous hand movements. So they were just opening and closing the hands without any defined pace, but just uh, trying to be as synchronous as possible. And uh, uh, just the, the behavioral data shows that uh, many of the, of the pairs were able to, to synchronize better than the, la the lag in the audiovisual link. Uh, so that's again something that you have a model internally, uh, which you update based on the sensory information. And uh, you can, by doing that, you can synchronize with the other person better than, than uh, the, in the immediate information you get would allow you to do. <coughs> okay, but so how do we analyze the actual brain data? I mean, analyzing the behavioral data in, in that way is, of course, trivial, but, uh, but then the brain data. Uh, so as I said, we don't have these kind of tools readily available. But uh, there are certain lines that are being pursued now in the methods development. So we can assess what could be called hyperconnectivity. So already now people are looking at the, the connectivity between different brain regions. So you, you can have uh, time result measurements of the activations in two regions and then you can look at the commonalities. You can use things like ranger causality, coherence, face locking and so forth. There are many other, um, I think many of you are familiar with some of these because they are used in many other time series analysis as well, totally outside of the domain of neuroscience. Uh, then, of course, we can correlate brain activity with external measures, uh, with the hand movements and, and so forth, with speech and all that. Then we can analyze statistically the signals from the two brains jointly. So we can, for example, do independent component analysis uh, using the joint data set from the two brains and see if you get independent components that are spanning both brains. You can also apply this uh, increasing the popular multivariate pattern analysis techniques or decoding or classification techniques. Then in MEG and EG we have a bit of a problem because uh, also we have a very good time resolution which is of course very good because interaction uh, progresses at a rather uh, fast pace so you, you ideally would like to resolve things uh, at the subsequent level just because already tens of milliseconds are, are important in, in, uh, in interaction. Uh, but the problem is that you can look at the data in many ways. So I was showing these evoked responses, so uh, they occur with, a, uh, with an accuracy of a, of a few milliseconds, uh, but then you also have this modulation of these uh, oscillatory uh, signals. And now you can look at phase coupling, of the oscillations of the evoked responses, of the modulation of the oscillations, and so forth. So there are a lot of different metrics that you can extract from the signals. And then you can combine these metrics in, a, in many different ways. So there is a very large shared space, if you, if you will. Uh, then uh, the correlations uh, may not only be between homologous brain regions. So let's, uh, by that I mean that, for example, the the left temporal cortex of participant A is not necessarily correlated with the left temporal cortex of participant B, but it might be correlated with some other part of the brain of participant B. So that's one thing. And then uh, if we are in interaction, so there's usually some, uh, there's both commonalities in the sense that we may have the same goals uh, and we have these models of what the other person is doing. But there is also this kind of antagonistic behavior or reciprocal behavior. So for example, when you are having a conversation at a high level, we are in agreement about the goals of the conversation, but at the level of actually conducting the conversation, then of course it's split in turns. And of course we use our brain differently during our turn uh, compared to when listening to the other person. So there's this kind of recip reciprocity in the, in the uh, behavior and, and most likely also in the brain activity. And in these kind of situations, the lags of the correlations may change. So to address these questions, so we uh, came up with a, with a method. Um, this is just purely signal analysis stuff. Uh, at this point, 
Um, so the, the idea there was that we would have the two data sets, then estimate spatial filters that, uh, that target certain brain region or regions. Then we have filters in the frequency domain. Then we estimate the energy uh, of that signal, which has been spatially uh, filtered and in a certain frequency band. Then we have a temporal delay that is unknown and then uh, we correlate the signals. And now what we try to do is to estimate the spatial filters, the frequency filters and the delay to maximize the correlation. So it's possible to show that this is mathematically doable. The problem is that you need to have very high quality data to do that. So there are so many degrees of freedom that, that uh, uh, the convergence doesn't necessarily happen otherwise. But, and, and this is, belongs to the family of canonical uh, correlation analysis. Okay, so that's just an example how to, how to do things. Another example uh, using an, uh, an existing technique is to compute uh, coherence between the brain signals. So this is again the, the uh, joint movement task. And now if we look at the coherence between the MEG channels, uh, so there is significant coherence uh, in the band from uh, 4 to 7 hertz. And uh, now this is this MEG sensor helmet. So the, the brain of the person would be underneath uh, the nose pointing to the uh, left here and to the right here. Uh, and now this region here is roughly above the visual cortex. And of course also here. And this is roughly above the motor cortex. So in this, uh, you can see that there is significant coherence between the motor cortices and the visual cortex of the two participants. So this is of course rather expe uh, expected because those are the circuits that they definitely need to use in order to accomplish the task. But this is just showing that, that uh, you can do now these kind of uh, things and then of course now our intention is to move to more elaborate analysis and, and more difficult tasks. Uh, some examples there, there's uh, again this uh, uh, joint movement data and now just like in that behavioral experiment I spoke about earlier, we had designated uh, leader and follower roles and then looked at the differences. And uh, so we saw that the beta, so the about 20 hertz activity, uh, is distributed differently in the case uh, that you're leading versus following, but otherwise executing exactly the same task. Also, in a conversation, uh, the 10 hertz activity uh, seems to peak before uh, the turn, so indicating or predicting the turn take. So from that you can tell in advance when your turn is going to end, uh, when the uh, other person's turn is going to end and it's your time to speak or to start speaking. Right, so these are now the early examples that, that we have uh, from the analysis of these uh, hyperscanning datasets. I hope there is more to follow. But there are these analysis difficulties, as I, as I explained. <coughs> okay, then generally, uh, what we get out of this analysis, the interpretation is not necessarily straightforward. So even if you find commonalities, uh, it could be uh, that it's really uh, reflecting a brain process that it's subserving the interaction itself. But you will definitely also get signals that are just kind of byproduct of the interaction, meaning that uh, because they are seeing, they are hearing uh, this partly uh, the same uh, world or the same situation, so there will be, say, activation in the sensory areas which are certainly similar because of the similar sensory input. And this is of course not something that per se would, would be uh, supporting uh, social interaction. Of course it's necessary for social interaction, but it's, it's not one of those mechanisms that would be, say, dedicated to social interaction. Uh, and now the big question is that can we separate these two? What is a good control condition? So the person should be doing something very similar but not be in interaction. And this is actually not easy to create this kind of a situation. All right, so then just to uh, conclude, um, as I tried to argue in the beginning, um, so our interaction is, or our behavior while in interaction is proactive rather than just being reactive. 
and in order to, to be proactive we have to maintain models or our brain has to maintain models which have this predictive uh, power of what's going to happen uh, in the immediate future. And one way, uh, one kind of a framework uh, for conceptualizing that is the Bayesian brain because uh, it most likely has to be a probabilistic model. Um, uh, but there are many things in our behavior uh, that cannot be explained otherwise. And now I also tried to argue uh, for this a two-person neuroscience approach where we study uh, a dyad, so the um, say agglomerate of, of two persons instead of just uh, uh, one person in isolation. And hyperscanning is a way to collect data from two persons at the same time. Uh, of course, the key idea is that we do not only collect data from the two persons at the same time, but we also analyze it jointly. And hoping that this allows us to tap on the brain processes that really support uh, interaction. And because these interaction sequences are, well, first of all, they are unique. Otherwise, if they weren't, so then you could just measure one person and then repeat the measurement swapping the persons. Uh, because they are fast, so you need to apply methods that have sufficient temporal resolution. And then the big question, could it be that actually the default mode of brain activity is interaction rather than being in isolation? Um, Obviously, it's not, we are not ready to answer that, but it looks like that it may well be that, that so many of the, of the circuits uh, are developed uh, to work uh, in interaction, not with just the outside world, but, but with, with other persons. Okay, uh, there have of course been a lot of, number of people who have contributed to this research. Uh, of course, Reitta Hare, academician and professor, uh, Emerita professor nowadays, so uh, much of this research has been her, uh, driven by, by her uh, research interests. And thank you for the attention. <laughs>